Okay, in front of you is a handy thing you can at least partially view on the internet, <clears throat> which is Gerhard Kittel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. In this case, it's only Volume 1. And the reason I'm making the video is to explain a tie between something Paul says and the Arch of Galerius, which I'm going to explain also in this video. In um, Ephesians 1.10, Paul uses a term, as you will see on screen shortly, oikonomia. <clears throat> that term um, is referring to estate administration, and he's leading into the period of Diocletian when he does it. Specifically, he's talking about the period um, of Valerian and Gallienus, the period leading into them, actually which is the period of Decius and all that good stuff, commonly known by um, Roman historians as the crisis of the third century. And of course, estate administration was exactly the gambit going on at that time. Who was going to manage Rome? So Paul's use of oikonomia um, is extremely useful at this juncture to help you understand um, Roman history and in particular that same fight about who was going to administer church was going on amongst the so-called church fathers. They were trying to get um, dominance over other Christians who disagreed with them. And so very real um, tie, which of course is the essence of Greek and Roman drama anyhow, there's a very real tie of the idea be that what's going on in the heavens characterizes what goes on on earth. So the earthly actor is represented by Rome in Paul, just as you would in any Greek drama. And the heavenly actor, of course, is God with the, f the fighting going on in church as causing the Roman history of that period. So that's our first little point of departure, is oikonomia. Now the second one, which you're now going to see, um, on screen is where we tie to Diocletian and to Galerius, which is the word oikumene. Okay, in Kittle's book, it's all linked under the keyword oikos. All right, and you can get Kittle the whole the whole lexicon, uh, all volumes. You can get them um, from Lagos.com as software. I have done that for about 200 bucks. Um, so all of this that you're seeing on screen is located under Oikos in the volume one of the Kittle. Okay, but the Greek term that was used by the Romans for their own religion was not oikonomia specifically, but oikumene. That's really important for what I'm going to say next. So just read the entry there. It's about the inhabited world. And what you're going to see next is that when the Romans wanted to display something like this, they personified it. And in Galerius's arch, they personify oikunume, mene, rather, and I'm pronouncing it with a heavy American accent, as a person. All right? That's why I have to show this to you now. So the word is related to oikonomia, which is estate management, meaning the management of the planet Earth, really. And then the inhabited earl world is called oikumene, and that's what is distinguished here in Kittle as a subset of oikonomia. All right? So I'm going to leave you for a few seconds to read the dictionary yourself. There will be a link to it in the video description so that you can read the meaning. Okay? And then we're going to have to now switch to... Um, the Pauline text, so you can see that. Okay, now we're looking at the text in Paul to reinforce what you just saw. And I'm going to get to the climax of this in a few minutes. Um, the key word that Paul uses is oikonomia. All right, this is the period that's the crisis of the third century according to modern Roman scholars highlighted here in black, 238 to 252 A.D., and this spans the time of 
Valerian and Gallienus, which basically was the um, splitting of the empire into two spheres effectively, okay, um, in order to make it easier to fight the barbarians and administer, okay. So to use the word oikonomia for this time is very wry. Typical Greek drama, the words say one thing on the surface, okay, but since Paul is doing a calendar, which is the kind of rhetorical style that's been established ever since Moses, but this time he's doing a future calendar for church, then the wry Greek drama usage of the term has special meaning, okay? I've gone through that before in my video, so you should be a little more alert now to the, um, what do you want to call it, the, the sophistication of this rhetorical style. Okay, so he's using oikonomia. Now related to that is oikonome. And you can see why now the text is going to be so wry. Because in Greek and Roman drama, the idea was always that the earth is playing out something that's going on in the heavens. That's always been the theme in Greek drama. Paul is, is expecting that his readers will remember that in what he writes. Okay. So when he writes this, and again, I've already reviewed the fact that pleroma means pregnant with cargo, whether it's a ship or a woman, okay? So it's the pregnant filling up of time's dispensation. And then you got Chiron here, okay? Now what the Greeks had done is they had depicted certain states. They personified them. So oikonomia is personified by a, a oikonomia. Um, oikumene, a Greek god or goddess, I don't remember which one, but it's depicted on the arch of Galerius. All right, so that's why I'm doing this video. And then you had Irene. Irene meant peace, reconciliation, and that was depicted as a goddess, even though it was really a kind of state or condition. Okay, it was depicted as a sort of handmaiden of the gods, sent to benefit mankind, and personified as Irene and then Oikumene. All right. Well, Oikumene is a, I think it's a woman filling up the times, pregnant with, you know, Irene, peace. That's all depicted on the Arch of Galerius, as you're going to see in a few minutes. So now look at how wry this text is that Paul says next. Okay, to characterize the Diocletian Constantinian period. The, what's highlighted here is basically the, the rise of um, Diocletian. He comes into power at the end here, dating his own reign at the date that um, Carus dies, and Carus dies in December 283. That's how Con Diocletian characterizes his own reign. Okay, and then under Diocletian, this is when Constantine comes to power. And it's going to continue the same ideas of Oikunume, the goddess, okay, Irene, the goddess, except he's going to Christianize them. It's all the same classical Greek mythology, drama, gods, ideas continued, except that they're Christianized, which is really what Paul's doing in his own language here. He's saying, hi, you Greeks think that it's the Greek gods, but really it's the real God with his own estate administration producing the peace. And by the way, this is going to be a pivotal time in history, which of course we now know it, it was, in order to bring under one head, everything in heaven and on earth. Now, what's running underneath the text is that the Roman emperors who were pagans at this very time were trying to do this very thing. Why? Because the Christians at this very time were warring with each other to see which one of them could unite all matters in heavens and on earth under themselves. This is the writing of the time of Irenaeus. This is the writing of the time of the bishop lists. This is the time of the writing that will eventually be codified by Eusebius after Constantine is in power. As if it were a heroic thing, when instead Paul is, is diagnosing it as the wrong thing. God's going to do his plan, but everybody else is trying to do their own. 
Paul's basically condemning what's happening amongst the Roman Empire and amongst the Christians. He's satirizing it. Because God is going to end up using the few, not politics. Our kingdom is not of this world, but the Catholic, what became the Catholics, and definitely the Romans at this time, they were all about this world. They didn't care about the next. They didn't care about scripture. They don't care if they lie about the apostles. All the Roman, the, the Christian writers of this time were selling lies about John and James. Oh, James ran around unwashed inside the temple. Oh, yeah? Oh, John had to pray for three days before he wrote his gospel, mixing that, you know, myth up with, um, you know, Esther, who did pray to pe ask people to pray for her while she fasted for three days. But they conflate that with John. John didn't have to pray to ask other people to pray for him before he wrote his gospel. You know, and then Irenaeus spills the tale that, oh, John met a heretic in the baths in Ephesus at the ripe old age of 110, and he didn't want to share the baths with the heretics who was running out of the baths. Oh, really? The church fathers didn't give a flip about the truth. So Paul is satirizing them in advance so you won't be fooled by them. The very writings they were writing at this time, trying to gain dominance so that they could sum under their heads all matters in heaven on earth, God is going to use it differently to achieve his showbread plan rather than theirs, rather than the Romans arguing politically, rather than the church fathers writing amongst themselves trying to gain dominance over the other Christians that they didn't like. Through whom God works out all things. Yeah, this is the period of the Diocletian persecution. You've seen me go through that in the videos now. Okay? For God's own standards and delight, using just the few, the pro picotas. You're going to see me cover this in more detail in episode 11U. GGS when I go through Constantine. But the reason I'm making this video now is the next segment. The next segment I'm going to read to you, all right, because I, I'm not allowed to show it on screen, but keep looking at the words here because this is going to be, you know, preserved um, on screen while I read words from a book by Ledbetter about what Galerius was doing and what it meant to the Romans then during precisely this period okay of the Roman Empire okay so keep looking at this on screen while I talk about it which I'm going to do next okay you see now on screen something called the Arch of Galerius the link there will be in the video description. It's a stamp, but it depicts what's actually in a section of something called the Arch of Galerius. Um, in order to explain what this means and the tie to what I've just said, I have to read from Galerius and the Will of Diocletian, a book by William Ledbetter. I cannot show you the text on screen so far as I know without violating copyright. So I'm reading it aloud while you look at the picture because that very picture is what's uh, in his book that he's explaining on page 96 of his book. Now I'm going to read to you what he says in that book, all right, on page 96. I'm going to start. Yeah, it's still on page 96, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, all right. I'm starting on page 96. I'm, I'm just reading what he says now. The conclusion of the peace between Persia and Rome, together with the restoration of some stability on the Danube, permitted Galerius' brief return to the East in 300 in order to take part in the celebrations. Rank dictated that the honors belonged to Diocletian. 
The Augustus rode through Antioch in a quadriga parading the results of Galerius's victory. Alongside, in the place of honor, walked the Caesar, a gesture which has long been misinterpreted. The parade of victory included the captives and concluded with a grand ceremony of sacrifice and thanksgiving. This sacrifice is shown in one of the best preserved panel reliefs on the arch of Galerius. I'm stopping there. What you see on screen is what he's talking about. You know, I'm depicting it from a different website in a stamp. But that's what he's talking about. Now, I'm going to go back to reading what he says so that you understand what you're seeing on screen. I'm still reading now from page 96 of his book. Diocletian is in civilian dress. Galerius is attired as a soldier. They stand in front of a colonnade, flanking an altar, on which appear the reliefs of Jupiter and Hercules. Diocletian watches as Galerius sprinkles incense upon the altar. Between the emperors are the figures of Irene and Oikumene. Hoimonia, Homonia, Noia may also be present, an arm linked with that of Galerius. Behind Diocletian stands Ion, the figure of the ages. The ideological statement is clear. Despite his complete victory over the empire's traditional enemies, Galerius was a servant of his master, linked by a filial bond of Concordia. Now think about that for a minute. Irene and Oikumene, Hoimonoia, Ion, these are all personifications of Greek gods. Paul, therefore, is using the key terms in Ephesians 1, knowing in advance how it will be depicted by the pagan Romans during that time. And what is Paul saying? Hello, the Christians are just as pagan as the pagans because they're engaging in the same battles with the same ideological pagan notions. Meanwhile, God is affecting his unification of heaven and earth under his son and the filling up of time's dispensation of church. So you got three battles going on there that Paul is depicting that this Arch of Titus ironically illustrates, not Arch of Titus, Arch of Galerius, ironically illustrates God doing his real plan of unifying heaven and earth, which is not taking place via the Christians, who are instead depicting that picture just as paganly as the pagans, fighting with other Christians to try to beat them so they can claim political dominance over other Christians, just like as depicted in the Arch of Galerius, which is depicting the domination of the Persian Empire, making Diocletian the head with Galerius, his son, of heaven and earth under one head. You get the irony. You see how what Paul's writing, yes, it has surface important political well political really spiritual applicability to us but it also depicts the times that are going to occur then so it is not repeat not complementary to Constantine and with that I end this video mm -hmm.